Players Pick Podcast, Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Okay. One, uh, n- now, yeah, we go. There we go. I hear him a little bit better than me. One, two, check it, check. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. It's good. What's up? You can go anytime. Good? Mick Rocklin. Thomas. Mr. J. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while, dude. And, uh, this is actually our first time actually getting to hang out and record yeah. uh, anything together. I, mean, I know, right? Because the next step is uh, a hit record. You know, like <laughs> we, we do this now and just, you know put out the <laughs> go big, the top ten five, you know, top ten record. Next. That's the plan. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being. I'm so glad that. Uh, it Dude, worked I've out. listened to so many of your podcasts now and have known you obviously mostly online. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, we met previously at Dunlop and stuff, but you know, so it's so good just to be sitting with a few feet of table between us so we can look each other and talk. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, love you, man. Love you too, man. I really <laughs> love what you do in the world, and that's part of like what is so exciting, you know, uh-huh. about uh, being friends with you. Is I learn a bunch from you. I learn mm-hmm. a bunch, uh, you know, on the guitar thing, but yeah, like uh, just how you uh, present what you have to share. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's really cool. And, and likewise as well, you know. I need. I think I need a little bit more calmness in my life. And and in fact, it wasn't too long ago when I was like, I was stressing really hard over a couple of things. I was about to have a bad, uh, a coronectomy. And I think I was really stressing hard about that. And it got to the point where I was like, you know, it was just playing on my mind so much. That was the day that I uh, messaged you on Facebook. That's right. And you took me through probably the best half an hour routine (laughs) sitting on my bed. But it was just like, ah, you know. So I think at that moment, I was like, I need some more of this, uh, you know. So I definitely uh, need to take some more inspiration from what you're doing. Mm. But uh, that was a great uh, that was a great moment as well. You know, it kind of fixed a lot of things as well and kind of got me back on track a little bit. You feel uh, a little balanced, more yeah, balanced now. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, definitely. Are you using some of that. I try. I, I was actually t- um, when you were talking me through uh, some things to try, like the breathing and the posture and just sitting in the you know the way to kind of go about things. Um, I was like, kind of, I was trying to be like super calm, but also like make notes as well. Um, and right. I took some screenshots as well. So, oh, that's yeah, good. yeah, it was amazing. I'm so glad to be of help to somebody that I care about so much. You know, oh, that's cool. Man, thank you. And <laughs> and man, like I have to say, uh, how cool it is. Like uh, mm-hmm. as at, for me as a kid growing up, well, like I guess I wasn't really like a kid kid I guess I was a teenager but yeah. finding Steve Vai yeah. and finding like audiences listening and all these tracks <laughs> yeah, and yeah. finding you but not but it, yeah. I didn't know who you were really sure, you know sure. I was like oh you're the little Stevie Vai yeah yeah and um, and then come to find out that uh, I get become good friends with Devin Townsend and Mark Cimino right and Mark's okay. like hey you know you know Thomas McRocklin I'm like no I don't know what are you talking about? he's like bad for yeah. good I'm like oh that sounds familiar and he's like yeah. you know little Stevie Vai and I'm like <laughs> Oh shit! And it all clicks. Yeah, it all clicks. It's like, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna do a new record and wow. come back and everything and do. I'm like, oh, wow. that's amazing. And but like, it wasn't just like uh, a child prodigy coming back. Like you, you kind of like reinvented yourself in a way. Like I, I think so. I, I think that started. You know, it was like 2016 when I picked the guitar up again after a long. I mean, like you know, probably the thick end of 20 years of not playing. When I say not playing, I mean, I went down to playing like 10 minutes in three months. So the smallest amount, and it wouldn't maintain because every time I'd pick the guitar, I'd I'd have that fear of, oh shit, that feels really bad. I'm going to have to put some serious time. And it's like when when you're used to playing at a certain level and then you're suddenly nowhere near that level, it was like I always knew at some point if the the love for playing came back, it was going to be like a hard first year or six months, you know. Sure. Um, and whilst I was away from guitar, you know, I was I was mixing and producing and doing other things, kind of you know, in the music uh, industry. I really got it. I really got into like mastering. You know, that was my thing. I mastered like a lot of records and tracks, and that was. That, that was a great thing for me because now that I'm doing music again, all those kind of skills that I kind of accumulated during my time off, it's like uh-huh. it's coming in really useful now. Um, but yeah, I remember just like picking up the guitar and, you know, it's like, oh, this just doesn't feel good. It feels like you're playing with boxing gloves on or something. <laughs> it just felt really bad. Uh, but that was like 2016. Yeah. Well, 
that's cool. That makes sense to me that you would have, you know, had had your hands dabbling in the music stuff. Yeah. You know, all along the way. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, yeah. So although I moved away from guitar, I mean, what got me away from guitar in the first place was I got my first sampler. Uh, really? my first Korg workstation and suddenly it's like I have my Akai sample on my Korg workstation um, and that was it it was like pretty much game over for guitar you know and this was back when I was like a, a teenager like 17 you know and a lot of people obviously found that like really strange and um, and probably you know like my immediate family especially my dad who uh, you know took me all those times to the US and we had a lot of trips together he was always there with me um, but suddenly getting into rap and drum and bass and then get my first sampler and like overnight walking away from Interscope Records and then bang right I'm doing electronic music now people wow. are like whoa what the hell what's going on here but but I but I do have a, a really obsessive kind of personality it's like everything that I'm into it's like tunnel vision on that one thing you know so um, you know for example after I <laughs> after I came back to the UK and start you know I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit I guess right. here but like I got really into games gaming um you know it's like really really into counter-strike have you ever heard of that game counter-strike i've heard of it it's like a first person shoot em up but i just got so obsessed and I, you know i was playing like 10 12 hours a day you know so i went through a period of time where i was like just doing nothing but gaming all day and night it was crazy wow um yeah very obsessive personality well that it well, lends well to being a stellar guitar player <laughs> I, think I mean so. like the attention to detail and like yeah. in the way you're filming yeah. too like in the way you're kind of doing jump cut like yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are, you, are you doing that in a wide angle and then like that's kind of right. zoom in that's like, right yeah so um, it was weird it's, it's kind of weird how I came about that you know it's like um, in 2016 2017 you know I stopped playing again and I kind of figured out you know I can get views uh, online and then Instagram was a great platform for me because you know all along I'm trying to practice I'm trying to write new material and work on new material but I want to have a social presence and you know a, an outlet of some kind so um so the early days you know I started Instagram like 2017 and um, it's really it was really frustrating in some ways because a lot of artists and guys who are known had been on since 2011 2012 when Instagram first started right. so in my mind I'm like oh damn I've got a lot of catching up in a very short space of time so um so basically I start kind of experimenting with stuff that you know I could play crazy licks but just put a little kind of wazzle dazzle on the idiot on, on the editing to kind of rack up those views and um when I had the biggest kind of growth on Instagram, when I went from like no followers to 100k followers, uh, that was all done like in a 12-month space, Jeez. and just trying to just smash out you know as many viral vis videos as possible. Um, so when I'm like when I'm focusing on Instagram, you know, I get like three, four million views a month, no problem. Uh, but I'm not that obsessive about Instagram. I mean, it's great the audience, and I love it. That's a great platform. Um, but I'm like focusing on like other things now so it's a little bit more balanced yeah. um but uh yeah so a shooting in wide and edit in in a square format and using that extra real estate real estate to kind of do funky sort of cuts um yeah. while still kind of keeping it short and entertaining i that think i think you might have been the first person to, to really like utilize that in that way yeah like I, I somebody's probably done it before somewhere but you kind yeah. of consistently brought it into a style yeah and I kind of I, you know I, I once I figured it out um, you know the earlier ones were a little bit brutal because it was just like too fast you know the cuts <laughs> were like making people sick <laughs> so it's like okay you know if, you know get that uh, fine balance and stuff but it worked you know because it, it kind of it, it as well as you know because what's Instagram what's interesting about Instagram is there's like a small pool of people that know me from back in the day and the majority of the audience just know me for the stuff that I post and, and now write and produce and stuff music wise so it's like it's always a bit strange when they when I see them figure out the past as well and link the two together and it mm. happens all the time you know because you have like these two different um, kind of audiences on there it's kind of it's a bit strange but yeah I mean and, and you have such a great Ibanez collection from yeah. that era right so like yeah. you got just 
those those nerds come out every time you're like, yeah, well, this is the one that I used on such and yeah. such or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Buy gave me this one, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You know, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like, no. Yeah, there's a nice collection there. I've got a... It's a fun... I like, I've got some of them beside my bed. I kind of still wake up and kind of look at them. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it... So, I, we're going to get to the picks here at yeah, some point. But, I, but what I'm, I'm, I'm curious is uh, about, about with you in particular is... Mm-hmm. Um, because when did you start playing guitar? Yeah, I I played my first tune, "The Boys Are Back in Town" by Thin Lizzy, uh, yeah. when I was four. Wow! And um, yeah, I remember kind of you know it was just that feeling, you know, when you kind of get the chord changes right for the first time ever. Um, it's probably one of the few memories I have from like being super early, but just playing, you know, those power chords and getting the change right at the right time. And I think I was so young, it's like my dad, you know, had guitars around, but he wasn't like a virtuoso guitar player, mm-hmm. although his name is John McLaughlin, which was always, ah. always hilarious <laughs> when guys in the US would like, you know, book me to do things. It's like, oh, your dad's John McLaughlin? It's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> it, whoa. it adds to the excitement. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, not, that John McLaughlin. not the virtuoso John McLaughlin, no. Um, but yeah, my dad always uh, had guitars around uh, the house and he, he'd go to work and drag him out from behind the TV and he kind of saw that um, had a kind of a thing for guitar and, uh, showed me my first couple of chords and I got the chords right and yeah uh, it went from there so four yeah. Wow and uh, again before we get to the picks I'm curious about I guess what what it is is that because it's it's an interesting thing when somebody gets fame mm-hmm. at a young age yeah right and you you had quite a wide reach at a young age, like yeah. through I, from what about what what age to what age do you think? I'd say, you know, when I was like seven is when I started to get on my local TV stations, mm-hmm. um, and when I was eight, I opened up for Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> in my hometown, <laughs> and that's where like the national stuff came in. So I was going down London to do like BBC stuff, wow. ITV, these different kind of TV shows. Um, so. It was like between seven and nine and ten. That's okay. where like there was a, a you know a big spur. But it was it was kind of weird back then because like you know the only thing I wanted to do was get back home and ride my BMX and you know hang out with my friends. Right. It was kind of like you know, and then I'd go off to London do a TV show, um, and then some of my friends would you know kind of you know did did see it on the TV. I did like Disney Club and stuff like that. Um, but you know, it's like it didn't really have an effect it was just like it wasn't even a job it was just you know and i was always really really like crazy quiet um and shy when i was a kid so it was like you know it would always make like uh really awkward in the best possible way like live tv you know because my dad would often come on the shows with me uh-huh. and they'd be like so you know we got this kid here and blah 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 and i'll be like i wouldn't even be responding you know like to half the questions i'd be so shy and quiet so often they just tell me to, you know, play, you know, just go crazy and shred. And then that, that's when I was like completely at home and comfortable and, you know, sure. never had a problem jumping on the stage, you know, so. <laughs> that's well, and do you feel like uh, that maybe your uh, choice to like jump on the Akai and do the beats and the hip hop stuff was yeah. kind of like a way to kind of get out of like to be able to stay home and kind of ride your bike and do whatever you want to do? Or um, was that? I, I don't, I, mm, possibly. Um, I mean. I always enjoy playing live for sure, um, and even just doing you know now that I'm kind of re- I've recently toured with Dragon Force and uh, we got to play some really cool shows and doing stuff at Nam here. I kind of do like the interaction with the audience and how it feeds sure. you and stuff. And even for me, like sometimes if I feel you know you just don't feel quite up to it, but you you just got to step it up and kind of pull through it. And then you you know that. Uh, that thing of playing in front of the audience always kind of does something to you. So I really, I really like that. Um, I'm definitely planning on doing more to it, but um, yeah, I, 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 it's a difficult one. I just remember really getting into rap and hip hop, you know, yeah. around about the time, not, not, not long after I'd signed with Interscope Records and they had a lot of the death row uh, artists on there. Oh yeah, yeah. So I got really into, you know, guys like Tupac and Dre and stuff, love yeah. that stuff. And um, in like the chronic, it's probably my favorite album of all time. That's amazing. I love that album. You'll 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 love to know that uh, I'm building Dr. Dre a Delos. Oh really? Yeah. Oh my god. For his studio. Well, yeah. I'm calling it the Drelos. 
Oh my god, seriously. <laughs> I mean, I we'll oh. see. He, he, we so his guitar player Kurt Chambers is here, and like right. we've been friends for a long time through EMG and all that stuff. And okay. since I'm down here in uh, in LA, I was like, hey. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's build you a guitar, and he's like, yeah. And he tried out a bunch of guitars, and he really let, fell in love with the uh, with the Delos as That's well. That's amazing. Uh, and he's like, you know what we need is we need a guitar just to stay at Dre's studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. um, yeah, I think we need to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, okay, so we we, we it's oh, we're building man. it right now. That's amazing. Should love be that. Like sometime next month, I get to yeah. go present. Yeah, I've done a few posts uh, with like uh, one of his tracks using the Delos. Funny enough, you know, oh. a little skit, you know, kind of, yeah. yeah. It's That's like it's now and again. It's the the post that I put on when it's the weekend, you know. Yeah. I kind of repost that one. See what everybody's up to on the weekend. <laughs> so many good little little good, uh, clean guitar lines. I love. Yeah, you know, there is from and those, it, those those the songs. You know? it, it, absolutely. Um, and it's 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 all those little details and stuff, you know. It's the stuff that's not quantized. It's the stuff that's not bang on. Um, the feel of those early records and stuff, and you know, particularly the Dre stuff. It's like, yeah, he's he's just a legendary producer. Love them so yeah. Chronic is literally probably my number one record. That's amazing of all time. I love that. I, I didn't Great. know that about you. So that's like yeah. I'm learning right now. It's amazing. <laughs> cool. We, it's cool to to share hip hop uh, with with a guitar player. Yeah, you know. and it's interesting for me because a, a lot of my phrasing on the guitar, I always when I'm playing, I'm always writing solos like I'm kind of rapping. So that's why I have a lot of these kind of lines that are like really phrased, like question, answer, and I'm uh -huh. trying to say as much as I can, but expecting a reply as well. Yeah. So I have a lot of question, answer uh, type of phrasing in my playing, and a lot of kind of phrases uh, as if you were literally rapping on there in terms of you know just the flow of it. Yeah. Um, I tried rapping once. That was really bad. <laughs> but I used to love doing it. <laughs> uh, I, I definitely uh, have rapped before. I have multiple songs that I'm I've sure we've created. all tried it. <laughs> I have. Well, see, I had a I have a crew that uh, of metal my metal band that I was in for years. Only yeah. Human. Uh, yeah. We all love the same West Coast rap stuff as well. Right, right. And so on the down low, not really, yeah. just just between us, we yeah, didn't yeah. really try to share it with anybody because yeah, it yeah. wasn't great. Yeah. But we had a really, it was like creating just, it was weird to create music for a very small, tiny audience with like five people. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like we're yeah, just yeah. passing around, it was just like burning CDs and ma mailing them across yeah, that's state the lines. Stuff, yeah. It's like, check out this stupid song I made about all of us. You know, and it's like, <laughs> That's amazing. One of us rapping about adventures that we've had or something yeah. or, or fake adventures that we're going to have. Or, yeah, amazing. You know, <laughs> we're not Love like it. not good, but like, you yeah. know, did it enough to like actually kind of get a feel for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. I love that. It would be, uh, yeah, but I don't know about <laughs> sharing it with anybody. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, good, good thing for me. A lot of my uh, attempted rapping is probably on DAT or something. Uh, and oh. I don't have a DAP player anymore. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, yeah. There's, Can't there's, access it. There's no transfers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting, interesting uh, little tidbit, too. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> and because your, your guitar playing started so early at four. Yeah. Uh, and your dad was your primary, uh, you know, uh, like teacher at the moment yeah he went he went he got me started yeah uh, and it was really difficult in that time as well because uh, there was very few guitar uh teachers you know in that area my mm. kind of lived in the north of the uk and guitar was like i mean it was a thing obviously but it wasn't you know there wasn't like like now there's probably like a hundred teachers in my hometown probably sure. more um probably a lot more actually but um so i i, I kind of had my early start from my dad and watching hot licks and david lee roth videos and stuff like that Rad. and listening to joe satriani and and by um then I, I the only kind of guitar lessons i actually got uh, was a few years later when i got um uh, got in like classical playing and then my dad took me for classical lessons it was like quite strict um you know and sometimes i'd go to my um teacher's door and i'd fake ring the doorbell i wouldn't actually press the doorbell because I didn't want to take it that week. Oh. <laughs> so I'm like, no, just waving at the car, like, no, uh, sorry, you mustn't be in. I'm like, you know, ding dong, not actually pressing the bell at all. And uh, did you skip class? I'd skip the class. But, but you know, I did go a lot. Um, and I learned a lot of theory stuff through the classical kind of lessons. Sure. And that's stuff that sort of stuck with me, like, through throughout my life. Um, iron uh, well, not ironically, just funnily enough as well, the harmonic minor is like the natural minor for harmonic as for classical. Oh, right. So that's like 
my default mine as an electric guitar player is also harmonic minor mm. but I always kind of disguise it and, and a lot of people when they when they play harmonic minor they, they start doing like these traditional na 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 yeah well that was really bad I'm, you can tell I'm not a singer <laughs> um, they do basically they emphasize the seventh uh, raised note right. so it gives you that really cliche you know Egyptian type of sound yep. um, but I kind of disguise it a lot so although uh, my normal minor is harmonic minor with a raised seventh I'm always kind of hiding it and phrasing it so it's not like that and I think that's one of the things that contributes to having like a little bit of a different sound you know mm. so, as well as a bunch of other things um, but yeah uh, but that that kind of approach to playing and, and certainly the, that that kind of default uh, harmonic minor thing is definitely from my classical boy days you know but that's cool that's fun so you just use the sevens kind of sparingly yeah in, when, when well yeah that, and I also bend it? bend from it a lot as well so oh. yeah so it's really subtle um, and I kind of I blend it with a lot of like diminished and chromatic stuff so I'm always I'm never afraid to like play notes which are not technically in key and phrase them in um, you know a lot of people are like okay where's the rules okay we're in this key uh, and they're thinking straight away what well, what modes do you think I could play and it's like well you know what I mean? you, you've got all these note choices um, and even if you go for notes which are not technically right if you come up with a way of phrase them right you're gonna come up with some cool stuff so it's like um, so I did a lot of theory when I was a kid uh, and went through a lot of grades and stuff like that um, but at the same time now as a kind of a uh, kind of current guitarist it's like I don't think too much. I mean, I have a lot of muscle memory and, and the ears, you know, look sure. really good. So in terms of if I hear a chord, I can react to it really well. But I'm never really thinking um, in theory too much, you know. Like a lot of people say, so um, what were you, what mode were you thinking of playing when you came up with this part? I'm like, it just doesn't even come into it. I don't even think like that. Um, I'd much rather kind of just go on instincts with like, you know, obviously you're going to... You know, it's a fine balance because you know if you just stop playing a semitone out, you know, instincts right. are going to kill you. But like, but my preference anyway is to kind of go off the ear, off the instincts, and mm. you know, react instantly in real time to what's what's coming in, you know, from a track. Kind of key center, but like, yeah, expand, like be open to all the possible interpretations. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I. The intuitional aspect of because I don't consider myself to have like a real great ear necessarily around it naturally. I've de yeah. started to, to develop a better ear. Yeah. But um, and I did some ear training and some schooling and in, in college and stuff. Yeah. But uh, it's an interesting when I draw when I when I kind of hear something. Yeah. Like I like I love practicing with backing tracks and I love that you create all these backing tracks because yeah. uh, it's very it's very exciting and it's great practice. Yeah. Uh, to just Hear something fresh, yeah, and, and try to try to try to vibe with it, try to meld with it, try to yeah. be. How do I enhance this? Yeah, definitely. And uh, the more I have done that, yeah, the more I, I, I surprise myself times sometimes where I'm like, how did I just pick the key out? How did I just? How did my how fingers did know where to go? Yeah, I don't. I, That's I amazing. Don't, I don't know. I it's a great it. thing, yeah, and um, it's a similar kind of uh, thing with my uh, electronic band, McRocklin and Hutch. Yeah, which is a more like that kind of '80s uh, synthwave inspired music that we're doing, and um, uh, a lot of the time, Hutch, uh, the other producer in the band, will like send me tracks over. And it's a little bit of a, you know, he likes to choose E flat and F minor a lot for some reason. Okay. Probably just to screw me over as much <laughs> as possible. Um, but a lot of the time, the chord progressions and the bass lines, it's not something that I would write. So instantly, I'm like on the back foot in terms of like, oh, well, what, what, what do we do here? Yeah. And then sometimes I don't want to do it, you know? Um, I just like say, oh, I, I don't like that track. But then I like kind of, you know my wife or somebody will go like you know just try something it says a decent beat you know mm -hmm. um, and then a week later it's like my favorite track you know just because I've like pushed through that like initial yeah. that feels a bit janky and or you know awkward to play over yep um, but it's so it's a good thing and kind of the more you do that um, it's a cool thing sometimes the you, you, something that, you ha that has tension for you uh, yeah. I think I find that like or for example, like when when I first hear a band or a song that I'm like, ah, I don't know, yeah, and everybody yeah. else loves it, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but when it when it when it breaks through, and you actually like, oh wait, now I get it. Yeah, like I've yeah, unlocked yeah. The thing. Let's hit that point. With, it's almost more exciting because you had you had a weird relationship with it. And yeah. Then it trans it transformed. Totally. You know? Totally. And, and whereas if you picked it up and you're like, oh, no problem, this is great. You know, yeah. Like it, there wasn't attention to release. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah. like the actual act of like not really being stoked. Yeah, and yeah. Then finding your way in, it's being a challenge. You're being challenged. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Um. So that 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 happens a lot with the McCrockett and Hutch stuff. You know, it's like, you know, mm. some of it just it's it's just it's super simple to shred over. Um. But then you have the other problem of like, okay, if it's super simple to shred over, how how do we get memorable kind of melody lines and that probably goes back to more like the question answer and replacing a vocalist with guitar yeah but we are adding vocals so so uh that'll be oh, interesting yeah we've got some amazing collaborations coming up with that stuff so oh, yeah cool. can't wait cool so was your did your dad you remember the the first guitar pick that you um, had with or around well your dad, i don't or? know if it was the first one but my very early picks all the time and you know I was like seven and eight and you know the only pick I would play at that time was the purple two mil Dunlop picks the oh. slates was that uh, the gator grip or? it was just a normal um, the two mil I mean you can get them now it's like that um, the Tortex I don't think it was talking it was Is like it the shiny oh Delrin Delrin right. 500 right okay okay that's what it is yeah. the purple ones two mil yep. um, slightly shiny and um I would. I, that was my. That was the pick I'd use. You know. So I was about seven or eight. I, I, you know, I'd have a bunch of those, and I'd use them everywhere. And now the only time that changed was I started going to the states a lot, a lot, and if I'd run out, I couldn't get them. It was always the hardest pick to find. Weird. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, uh So the two mil was like my default, and then when I was about ten or eleven, I was living with Steve Vai. Um, and we we um, we recorded the Bad for Good record together. And Steve had a bunch of like there must have been about a point eighty eight, mm-hmm. um, and they were like all over his house, you know, like bags of them, you know. Sure. Um, so I started using those, but then I didn't really like the shiny um, thing. I used to find like they would um, they would kind of rip into kind of too easy for me. So I started using the Tortex point eighty eight, the green ones. Yeah, yeah. And that become the became the, the default pick that I would use until I stopped playing guitar. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then once I was on the point eighty eight, I found wherever I was, I could always kind of get that pick, and it was just a nice balance of flex. Uh, the the sort of feel in the hand of the Tortec was really nice, and um, and it wasn't until I stopped playing again in twenty sixteen that I went through like loads of different options really quickly mm-hmm. and kind of landed on something that I think is like unbeatable for me mm. and that's when I sent you a bunch of yes. picks and you went through all the flow and like some jazz three or something yes like that. yeah I hit the jazz trees the red ones yeah I really like those um, but what happened was I was I, because I went from not playing for such a long time to suddenly playing 10 hours again and that's the kind of hours I play when I was a kid you know wow. like every day uh, and I, I didn't have school. Uh, I left school at a really young age. Wow. So in my, I had a private teacher though. Sure. But in my mind, even when I was like eight or nine, I'd wake up at nine o'clock and I'd do at least school hours practicing. So I'd do like theory, I'd do like shredding, I'd do like playing along to you know dra- jam tracks, playing along to albums, and then the theory teacher would come over and stuff, you know. So I'd have like that kind of um, approach and, you know, as a, as a sort of young kid, like I'd really pack in the hours. Wow. So when I start playing again, um, 2016, 2017, um, I went instantly to playing big hours, you know, like six, eight, nine, ten hours a day. But that gave me a lot of wrist pain, um, and my right hand was really, you know, painful, quite sore. So I found um, the Jazz 3 XLs because they were a bit stiffer, and I really like. I, I was like, all right, I want to be really good at alternate picking. I want, you know, because I want the lyrical um, phrasing in my playing. Um, that was the best way of getting dynamics, you know, just being really good at picking because, you know, that rap flow, again, I right. found that was the best way to do it rather than kind of thinking like economy picking and all these different types of picking. So um, so I, I was uh, for a little while using the Jazz 3 XL, like the XL shape, and then I moved down to um, the new at that time, uh, not flow, it was the Prime Tone, um, the original batch, which was like 0.88 and 0.73. Yeah. Um, and I was dancing between those for a bit, and for about three or four months, the point eighty eight prime tone was like the unbeatable, and then the flow shape came along, 
and then that was it it was like suddenly I could pick better I could slice through the strings better I could do things you know with more precision mm. it was just like you know and the pick it's like I, I, I change angles a lot um, whether it's um, you know kind of like uh, pointing like facing away from the strings or uh, the, the sort of tip of the pick pointing towards the bridge I change the angles a lot when I'm playing and the flow shape um, is great for that it's just really really cool and um, I settled on the 1.0 flow nice. and uh, it's got a great natural grip it's got a tiny bit of flex in it so when I'm kind of smacking rhythm stuff really hard uh, my wrist is not taking the brunt of that um, punishment right. yeah. uh, but I can still go hard with the alternate picking as well so yeah Amazing. the 1.0 flow 1.0 flow yeah I, my friends have been calling me the flow ho because <laughs> <laughs> i'm like they're like what what gauge are you on today and i'm like yeah. ah, man i don't know I'm like, did you see that video i posted the um the bottle uh challenge oh yeah that's one of my favorite videos you ever did uh, well i used it was the 420 the 4.2 yeah, this one that is the boy this boy here yeah. that took the lid clean off that bottle <laughs> and that was a one take you know that's so crazy i couldn't believe it i was like the i'm gonna post the non-edited version of that uh without the slowdown it's just me kind of like setting the cameras up and then i go for the move and throw the pick across the table it takes the lid off and it's like oh yeah yeah dude. curse curse uh i couldn't believe it it literally just a one shot thing but um uh, but i think it took the power of the 4.2 flow it's a great pick really cool i have a few of these it's fun and pick. they're actually you know that you think when you uh, when you first pick it up you think is it a joke right I, is this a joke because i mean you can hear that i mean it's yep. crazy but it plays really well it's um, one of the few th really thick picks that yeah. uh are very usable yeah no yeah. so i don't know if it's the bevels but it's really usable i don't i don't i don't pick it up and play with it like very often but the times where i have picked it up it's like it shouldn't be a thing but it actually works really well uh, I like it, but um, yeah, I'm I'm really weird though. I like you know I like what I like, and when something's on and that's the one, I tend not to change it. You know, yeah, I'm like that with like pickups, guitars, you know, whatever amps. Sure. Yeah, although I change tone and stuff quite often. Yeah, but that's then, you know you go through phases, right? Yeah. And you get you're really into it while you're into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it's time to change. Yeah. It's time to change. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. But I think it's gonna take some some heavy pick to uh, defeat the flow 1.0 agreed the flow is kind of uh it's kind of an anomaly like it came out and it's dominated so hard you know mm -hmm. like so many players have picked it up and and decided that that was their pick yeah uh, that's great the uh <clears throat> i don't know I, I would say i think on the floor 20 i think uh the two that i can think of right now are mike keneally okay and tony mcalpine Oh, they're using them, are they? Yeah, that's yeah, that's pick. awesome. I was like, they're they're kind of like playing thicker picks anyway. Right, the right. I showed that to them, and yeah, they both were like, "What?" Yeah, I mean, you know, for a certain type of playing, um, like one thing that you can get without uh, as much. Um, for me, thinner picks require more physical motion because the pick has to push through the string. So the thicker you pick, um, you can get a lot of attack, but with less physical energy used. Right. For me, so um, so when I play thicker picks, I'm interested in trying uh, these ones. Actually, this is a um, new flow gloss. Through flow gloss. Okay. Yeah. Um, but for me, it comes down to tone a lot of the time as well. Like I'm really like the the difference between certain materials is like huge, mm -hmm. and I love the tone of the flow, but the size, um, like. I kind of like that I have to work a little bit with that because it has that tiny bit of flex yeah and that little bit of flex does mean you have to kind of you know get into it it's not like your arms like bulging with like you know but there is a physical true. difference of like how you would approach playing with like a two or a three mil versus a one um, oh it's true like well the fact that a, a thin pick it's a really thin pick like if this I got this Justin Timberlake one that's a point forty six. okay I made that for Justin Timberlake wow. uh, it's a nylon but like You'd have to work really. You'd be working overtime to try to get that, get it back. Yeah, it's flopping back. And that's you, right. You have to wait for it, and then yeah. You, and, so, and the faster you become at playing, then all these little micro things, they just all they, mount up. You know? Yeah. It would. 
the 420, I, I feel like when I give it to somebody for the first time, I say, hey, relax. Yeah. Because it's like having a lot of leverage. You, you don't have to work as hard. That's right. To yeah. do the thing. Yeah. Um, and, That's it. You know, so if you're doing like sweeping and stuff, this thing just glides like butter through the strings, yeah. you know. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> So, um, switching gears a little bit. Yeah. Uh, growing up, did you uh, uh, were you? Do you have any religion or did you have any spiritual practice or anything? No, family? no, there, there wasn't really a lot of that in my family. You know, growing up, um, it was just like me and my dad. We've gone through you know a lot of stuff together in terms of you know my mom and the rest of my brothers and sisters would be at home. Yeah. Um, and then we'd hit the road together, you know, we'd be back and forth uh, to London and then, you know, we kind of eventually uh, played at a NAMM show and um, got discovered by, I think it was a guy called John McLean, um, who signed me to Interscope Records and, wow. and that's where all the kind of US side of things came in from there. Do you consider yourself spiritual at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where, do you, where does that derive from? Um... <sighs> I'd say going back to probably, you know, meeting my wife, you know, yeah. um, you know, who's a Muslim. Yeah. And um, I think it's great just to have some kind of balance and, and kind of beliefs, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Um, yeah, you, sh I, you know, it's just like, I, I'm, I'm just, I've always been kind of super open minded and stuff and, and not being closed off to kind of any um, approach, you know, it's just like, you know, sure. and um, not being prejudiced against kind of any kind of beliefs as well. So yeah, I think that's uh, it's, it's definitely a good thing, you know, to yeah. kind of you know believe in, in that as well. Do you and have you learned? I mean, how long have you been with your wife? Um, I got married. Well, we got married when I was like um, eighteen. Wow. We were neighbors. Wow. Yeah. Oh, can you believe been together that? a long time. Yeah. Um, basketball. Uh, that was another thing I was really into yeah. playing basketball. Cool. So my ball would go into her garden quite a lot. Oh. And I'd have to go knock on the window. Sorry, can I get my ball again? Exactly. Yes, and out would come Amoni. Yeah. <laughs> I think she thought it would be a bit weird because back then I had such long hair as well, you know? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> who's this dude? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how, how long before you, did you ask her out at some point there? Or um, just naturally? We would just become friends, actually. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, it's, it's crazy because, like, I did a little bit of teaching as well at that point, um, so it's like I would teach a couple of lessons on a Sunday afternoon, and we go to the movies and buy pizza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like once a week. So amazing, <laughs> so crazy. Um, so yeah, we were neighbors, and then um, it, it didn't take long at all. I think I think it was like how we got married was like. Um, I was come over to LA to do um, a guest solo on somebody's uh, record. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, let's turn it into a honeymoon. Perfect. No, no thought whatsoever. Wow! Bang! So they so. came here, and she's out. looking over, like you know, I can't hear anything, you know, and like uh, we're we're talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, you know, and I, I think I think a lot of things are easily overthought. Sure. Um, and a lot of people would be like, "What? You got married when you're 18? Are you crazy?" And for me, it's like. Why? Wow, it's like, what's what's the big deal, you know? Yeah. I think uh, uh, that way about a lot of things, you know. It's everything. I'd much rather look at any situation as, you know, what's the positives in it. Right. Yeah. There's no point in kind of dwelling on the negatives or the stuff that's going to hold you back. You know, it's just a waste of energy. Well, if it feels right, it feels right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's so. Did you have you learned uh, from uh, a lot about mo Muslim religion from yeah, your wife? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, you, know, you know the lifestyle, not drinking, the discipline. Yeah, it's great. You know, um, because uh, you know what? Before I met my wife, um, I mean, I like to drink a lot. You know, really? you know, too much. Um, and I'd you know, be crazy. When I was like 15, 16, 17, I was probably really fast on the way to destruction, you wow. know. Um, and it was just, you know, it was just really bad, you know. I'd be like drinking a lot. People would come and visit me. I'd be like, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I remember like this guy came from Scotland to do an interview with me. Um, and my bass player, my drummer was in the house. We used to have like a guest house that the bands would stay in and stuff. And, um, you know, I'd be like just sick all over myself and they just put me in bed. I was like oh, drinking man. every night. Um, and I didn't stop drinking actually because of my wife. Actually, it was like I, I naturally hit a point 
where I was like, this is just not good. You know, it's it's not. It, it's just there's just the fun had gone and it just wasn't right anymore. And you know, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm never drinking again. And I was like 18 or so at that time. And um, wow. again, it's like I don't see, you know, you know the benefit. I mean, I certainly don't mind hanging around with people having a drink. Sure. No problem. Um, you know, that's your decision. But certainly, it was like I hit that point. I was like, all right. Nah. Well, it sounds like it's made your life better, period, like just making that choice. Yeah, I think so. And um, it's just, for me, just having a, you know, a clear, you know, I'm still probably a bit crazy and (laughs) and, and make random decisions, but at least it's a a sane, sober decision and, you know, um, it's not like the booze doing things, you know. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And, um... So we have a little bit of time left, but uh, awesome. I'm curious about like what you're listening to lately. Like, yeah. uh, is there anything that's uh, like you can't let go of, or any any artist um, that you might want to share? It changes so much. Um, I mean, in terms of like gu- guitarists, you know, um, could be anything. Yeah, but yeah. It's weird. I mean, for me, I mean, I, do, I, I like listening to synthwave. You know, that's that's kind of like my thing. Um, and it's 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 like sometimes I will put '90s tr- uh, hip hop and rap records on, and that that's that's just what I want to hear. And then you know sometimes I'm listening to like LeBrock or Gunship and The Midnight, which are all these kind of synthwave current stuff. synthwave guys. Yeah. And then if I want to listen to guitarists and stuff, um, I really like Chon. You oh know? yeah, I really like those. Uh, the really cool guys, amazing players, um, and. I, I, there's just it's there's a nice balance, you know, of like insane playing, but at the same time you can you can listen to it. It's not kind of overpowering, you know. You can kind of you know, it's like a it's a really cool balance. So. I call I call Chon indie shred. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I don't know if that's really it's, accurate. It's but. like they're showing all these amazing skills and chops, but it's it's not overwhelming on your kind of ears, you know. Slay it's kinda, back. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, but there's a lot of amazing guitarists around these days. I mean, it's like it's great to see like the electric guitar at the point where it is now. You know, because growing up, it's like, okay, is it Eric Johnson, Vi, or Satriani, or Randy Rhodes? You know, or Van Halen. You know, but you had a very you know, it was like you could count on you know one hand you know who was doing who was making moves. You know, right, right. Um, now it's like it's everywhere and the guitar I think because of that has uh, progressed a hell of a lot in a very short um, um, which is great yeah it sure has man and we were talking about the last podcast that how it's interesting how um, it kind of comes in waves like the the, the innovators come in waves like you know like every five ten years or whatever you you have somebody that makes a real divergent mark yeah you know uh, like we were talking about you know how Eddie Van Halen obviously is one that would make a big one. You know, Vi yeah, and the yeah. different people for different genres. Yeah. Uh, but then, like in metal, like to have a Mashuga or a Pantera yeah, yeah, come yeah. along and how they change the game, and then Absolutely. there's all these people that, yeah, you know, kind of have to cop that sound. You know, for sure, uh, because it 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 affects yeah the, uh, so so heavily. Yeah. That, Absolutely. And then it, we kind of almost wear it out. Like yeah. as, as a society, we're like, oh, we're all doing the thing, you know, yeah, we're all, yeah, all yeah, copping yeah. some yeah. influence, and then it's bang, it's something else. Something else comes along, we're like, whoa, yeah, yeah that's yeah. interesting. I want a little bit of that. Yeah, I, mean, I love that. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, I like that, um, especially guys. You know, are not afraid um, because you know, it kind of takes that uh, degree of like just kind of self belief and right. You no, know, this is something. Let's let's make it. You know, let's put it out there and do it. You know, rather than tagging onto the the previous last genre that was. Uh, you know the the last big thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean I'm I'm a fan of of good, a good homage. You okay. know, I'm yeah. a fan, like so like you know you doing synthwave guitar stuff, super yeah. fucking cool. I think, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and, or anybody that is just genuinely like yeah. interested in like a, a a genre or a style. Yeah. yeah. But then but then it's always really like courageous to watch somebody like mm-hmm. step out and go no i mean i know you guys haven't heard anything like this yeah yeah but give it a shot yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, and i think you know what's what's the worst that can happen you know it's like for me um that's why I, you know i don't really get worried too much about playing on stage and in front of the pe- in front of people because you know the worst that can happen is you can make a mistake we all make mistakes like you know non-stop you know it's like we play so many notes you know, some less than uh, others, sure. but like 
the worst that can happen is you hit a bum note or a note that you didn't ten intend to play. Like, okay, so what's the big deal, you know? So, and I think once you get rid of that kind of fear, you know, yeah. that allows you to um, play, you know, whether it's Instagram Live or other lives or in front of people, you know, physical people, uh. um, you know, it kind of changes your, your mentality on it, you know, because, you know. So that's an interesting thing too, live and playing a wrong note, right? Like, and there's yeah. all these different uh, yeah. things that I, I feel like back in the day, mm -hmm. I remember multiple times being on stage and trying to keep it together. Like if I play a couple of wrong notes yeah. or get just get a fret off or something from yeah, where yeah, I yeah. thought I was, you know, yeah, on yeah. a live dark stage and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. hear the cacophonous like, yeah. sound, like it's everything I could ever do to try to not like want to like, not do that. Like, yeah. Well, give up, you know, like you get be so, so distracted that you don't carry like recover yeah. and, and, and carry on. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. It's, it's a different one. I mean, for me, um, improvising has always been something that I think has been a real strong point and jamming with people mm -hmm. and I think it's because at a young age I didn't really have lessons so much but my dad would get as many people around to jam with him as possible uh. and that that really helped with kind of those situations um, so a lot of people they routinely like they practice their track um, so it's absolutely perfect to the track that they've released um, but consequently, if they go off track, like ever so slightly, um, they find it really difficult to recover. Um, or if they make a, a one note mistake, you know, yeah. it's like it's ruined their evening. It's crazy, you know, how much pressure they put on themselves, you know. Um, you know, we, we obviously we want to play to the best of our ability and showcase what sure. we can do. But at the same time, um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to like, you know, kind of. Uh, screw a few bits up or improv and react and kind of change things on, on the fly and recover you know as yeah. soon as possible you know so gotta have fun you know and I think that comes becomes you know the priority and I think that, yeah I mean the more I play to, to a, a wider range of backing tracks and like and really like try to hone some yeah. skill of listening and the whole thing yeah the more i mean i play a thousand wrong notes when i'm at home by myself not recording you know like yeah, like, yeah, yeah but a lot of it has to i it's it's been a really great practice to yeah. play a wrong note and either a keep going if i'm really really yeah. like focused on a certain totally. certain line or something yeah but also like you said earlier play almost any note yeah it's just it's how you end up phrasing it can you Absolutely. turn it into a phrase yeah totally kind of makes sense totally. Totally, and um, yeah, it's 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 just about the recovery and the reaction, and um, you know the mindset as well. You know, it's funny. It's like a lot of people practice so hard, and then maybe they go in a music store or they play in front of people for the first time, and then the tunnel vision kicks in, and everything they've worked on and practiced just goes out of the window. You know, totally. And um, you know that that's a big thing for a lot of people, and um, it's actually something that comes up a lot on the messages on my um, School of McRock platform. Um, it's like I, I practice, you know, these things really hard, and I go to jam with people, and then it all goes out the window, and it just goes down to the very basics. And it's like I think a lot of the time in those in that situation, it's a self belief and confidence thing, and you know, kind of right. No matter what, I'm gonna kind of play exactly the same, no, no matter what the situation. If it's like in front of you know your wife or a thousand people or more. You know, it's just you have to have that kind of confidence. Now, the interesting thing is the confidence doesn't necessarily need to be real. Hmm. So you can give yourself a little bullshit and say, <laughs> I'm going to play the guitar and whoever I play in front of or I'm, whoever I'm going to jam with, I'm going to annihilate them because, you know, I'm me. Yeah. Yeah. So you can think like that. I like and that. Now, if you put that out there, you, you sound like an arrogant mofo, but you need a little bit of that. Sure. to get you over the edge and when it's like coming to like okay when it's time to play to your uh, full ability because this mistakes are one thing but not playing to your full ability because uh, a, a mindset or a, a fear that's the worst thing you know the crippling part of it you know yeah so like you need to have that kind of mindset like I'm gonna blaze I'm gonna kill it I'm gonna own everybody in front of me right now and I don't care what it takes yeah and then you know then then you go I love that. I love because it's like a kind of fake it till you make it kind yeah. of like a thing. But with a guitar. But with a guitar. Yeah. And I love, uh, I mean, well, the, 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 
I guess what I've been saying all along is that just the more time on the job, yeah. so like if you want to get be good at jamming with people, yeah. you need to jam with people yeah. all yeah, the time yeah. totally. as much as possible. Yeah, be, yeah. be willing to get in front of a lot of other guitar players that are way better than you. Yeah. And I like this too because my buddy Joe has been coming over a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a he's an MI kid. He's like really really yeah. schooled and studied a lot of yeah. players that I haven't studied. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot more sense than me. Yeah, sure. But I love I love hearing somebody else make sense in front of me and watching the process and going. Yeah. And and I, I notice how my phrasing starts to change as we're jamming over the same jam track or yeah, or yeah, we're yeah. trading fours or whatever. Uh -huh. And it's like. And I, I listen to his, I'm like, oh, and it, it gives me these different exa examples and these ideas. Yeah. And before you know it, this, the anxiety of playing in front of somebody yeah. isn't there anymore. Yeah, it's, exactly. Or it, it's at such a low level. Yeah, that, that's it, that you can play what you would yeah. like to play then, you know. Yeah. So I think that's it. It's just like basically do whatever um, is required to just make sure that the tunnel vision shutdown thing doesn't, you know, kind of kick in, you know, because... You know, I, I, when, when I started doing lives on Instagram, you know, like a couple of years back, I remember the first couple of times I'd do it, I, I would have a little bit of that happen. I was like, oh, damn, we're live now. The pressure's on to, you know. A sweat, sweat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's no going back. You know, people are going to see mistakes. But, it's like, uh, the more you do it, um, you kind of just become accustomed to kind of just not letting that stuff affect you and just kind of, you know, just just having as much belief in what you're doing as possible. And dude, like I honestly, anytime somebody that is proficient at the guitar as you are mm -hmm. shows their their human side and shows their mistakes, yeah. It's actually such a beautiful gift to the rest of yeah. us because it's this it's it, there's a weird thing where like women and mm -hmm. and men too, but oftentimes yeah. women look at these uh, beautiful magazines and like that's yeah. that's the what I'm supposed to look like. Yeah, and yeah, you have yeah. this weird you That's know, right. thing we do that with as guitarists too. 100%. We look out and go, "Oh, I'm you know, if I'm going to be re re loved and respected as a guitar player, I yeah. have to be perfect, yeah. and I have to be as good or all, in all these ways, yeah. and I can't so, show that I, there's any weakness." Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's not true. It's just Absolutely. not true. There's a huge process behind the scenes. Yeah. And whenever we show a bit of it, or we just yeah. just show that like it's a little, yeah, it's not perfect. You know? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And it's often it's like it's those moments and that bit that kind of you know makes you really dig that that person or player even Agreed. more you know um yeah it's it's funny because like for me i i i love to see somebody improv around the track as opposed to just reciting the track perfectly i'm much more impressed by you know like something that you know some a little slip up caused this diversion but it ended yeah. up being okay in the end i love that Whereas, like, you know, I mean, watching somebody do 45 minutes of their record and it sounds exactly like the record, I mean, technically, we'll, you know, we'll get the scorecards out and we'll give them 10s, but, like, it wasn't, it's never that enjoyable, um, you it. know, it's like, ah, oh, okay, that was great. I could have just put the CD on, though. That's it. And I, I, there's so many great players that can recite the record verbatim, and I get mm -hmm. that. And I'm so, I'm, you know, I get, I, I agree. Like, mm -hmm. the technical proficiency is there. And yeah. Great job. Sure. But if I, I already have the album. Yeah. Exactly. I already have your videos. Yeah. Like, I think, show me, <laughs> like, show me how, like, you're gonna express this song to me now today in this yeah. very moment. Exactly. And let it be a little different. Yeah. No. Even if it's just the, a, a shift of. Yeah, but where the pocket is. Even if That's it's just right. Like these little exactly, things, you because know? yeah, depends how you feel. You know, it depends if you've had you know two chocolate balls before the show <laughs> and you're a little bit ahead of it. You know, um, or um, before I played Fishman earlier, you know, I was really hungry and my legs were like jellied. You know, and I could feel my arms jelly out. You know, uh, you, you, yeah. you know? and that actually settled me in to playing a little bit more. Really, because um, I had a little bit more of a battle with myself to make it happen. You know, and it wow. you know it's like. To play, you know, 50 minutes of a certain type of music without, you know, screwing it up so much, it's like, it takes a lot of mental power to, to do it. You know, yep. you think, okay, I play 10 hours a day, I play 6 hours a day, you just go do it, it's easy, it's a, it's a thing. But, like, you have to be, uh, you know, really in the right mindset to do it. And uh, also, when you do make those little mistakes, which, you know, there's like three or four mistakes in the boss performance earlier, um, you know, some people notice it, some people won't. But like how I let that affect me for the rest of that, you know, gig, it's like, you know, that comes back to that mindset thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. But a lot of this, the, the sort of 50-minute sets that I've done, um, 
most of it is the track, but then there's bits which I haven't learned the original solos from on purpose because it gives me that opportunity to kind of have the fun moments for myself, ah. which is the improv solo bits. Yeah. Um, um, so that's kind of what I've done. You've kind here. of baked in your own improv stuff yeah. by, by kind of not yeah. purposefully not going back and I've trying not to learn the record. That. Yeah. yeah. So like the that. main bits, like the memorable sort of melodies and stuff, are all there. Um, but I haven't went back to try and learn the solos no for no. First of all, because it takes a long time to do it, because a lot of the time I'm like, yeah, let's just try that, let's try that. And then, of course, oh, what? I've got to play that live. Right. But then at the same time, it's like I could learn that, and I have learned a lot of, you know, tr uh, solos which are really like choppy, choppy, like really like edited together. Sure. And I relearn them again afterwards. Um, but then at the same time, I like to kind of leave um, space for those. Uh, you know, kind of just how are you feeling at that moment? What's what's going on? Yeah, it's a um, fine line. I think yeah. uh, for for artists in general, like when you come to see somebody uh, as a fan, you, your expectation is you you definitely want to hear something familiar. Yeah, you're not looking for all improv. You're not yeah. looking for all like drastically different. You, I came here for something that I yeah. know about. Yeah, but at the same time. Uh, if I get if it's all too perfect, yeah. then it's like I could have just stayed home, man. I didn't have to yeah. use the I didn't have exactly. to pay for parking to come and see you, you know? <laughs> especially Nam parking. <laughs> yeah, Nam parking is outrageous <laughs> if you can find it. You know? Exactly, yeah. exactly. I think uh, I think we're a little over. Yeah, cool, man. Um, sorry, uh, but we have to s shut it down, man. Shut it down. Yeah, it's all right. Nam police. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, These guys uh, got other things to do. Awesome. Um, it's been so good talking to you, man. Yeah, Thank likewise. You. Thank Thanks you so much for being my guest here. And um, my pleasure. Let's uh, let's let's take a picture out here and hang out. Amazing. Sounds good to me, buddy. Right. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye yeah. bye. Bye. bye.